recording now so we are going to do kind of an experiment here this is an aftertake from your invisible shoot uh, show <laughs> your invisible toolbox show on october 2nd we were joined by ambassador quinn for the live broadcast and he has kindly agreed to stay with us for a few minutes the stories and the insights are just so useful and we know that our viewers will love to tune in for this uh, outtake at the end so you had started, uh, before we turn the camera on, to tell us a little bit about uh, the, the Peace and Visions magazine, yes, Iowa so, State magazine. Yes, so if you're an Iowa State alum and you get Visions magazine, you go to page 34 of the fall current issue, I have a story in there about a man named Paul Mather. And it's set in Hanoi of 1977, two years after the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, the first mission by Americans ever back to Vietnam looking to account for POW MIAs. And uh, there have been some negotiations. We've encoded a message, and I'm walking to the telegraph office to send it back to Washington. And uh, Paul Mather, a young Air Force officer, walks with me. And as we're walking down this deserted street at 11 o'clock at night in, in Hanoi, and I find out from him that he's from Iowa, went to Iowa State, in, as engaged to a Vietnamese woman who is trapped in Saigon, doesn't know when she'll ever get out, when they will ever be married. I said, are you doing anything to try to get out while we're here? He said, I could never endanger our mission, what we're doing by trying to do anything for myself. So I get the name of, of his fiance and her ID number, and I go to Leonard Woodcock, the head of the United Auto Workers, who had been appointed by President Carter. He's going to be our ambassador to China mm -hmm. uh, after this mission. And he's there negotiating with uh, North Vietnam. And I go to him and I said, the negotiations are going well. There's a good vibe. I don't think I said vibe, but you know, <laughs> that's what I meant. Uh, and uh, I said, the Vietnamese would do something nice for you just to be part of that. And here's this uh, young military officer on our team. His fiance is stuck in Saigon. Here's her name. If you privately ask the head of the Vietnam delegation to assist with her, he uh, is not gonna agree right away, but I think they'll do that. At some future time. Yes, so you have, negotiate, <laughs> have negotiations across the table. And then afterwards, Woodcock and the lead Vietnamese negotiator sit in the corner having tea, chatting privately with just an interpreter. Woodcock gives the name, explains the situation. Two months later, the word comes to Washington from the Vietnamese. Uh, Miss so-and-so has been released. She uh, and her children fly to Bangkok. They're reunited with Paul Mather. They've been together. Uh, ever since. Their two sons went to Iowa State University oh, wow. as well, where I have an honorary degree. But it was one of those moments in negotiation. You find something, doesn't cost the other side anything, but it is perceived as a very nice gesture. It adds to that environment. Finding things you can do that don't cost anything, but are perceived with gratitude by one side or the other. Uh, can be a, you know, a marvelous element. Yeah, and then the law of reciprocity just exactly. kicks in that sort of ex the human ex nature ex function. Exactly, exactly. It's sometimes the small personal things. Yes. Understanding about what are the interests of the people you're dealing with. What a great story. It is. Well, tell us, uh, tell us more about the World Food Prize. You know, this is the prize that they do for food and agriculture, for quality, quantity, feeding this growing population. The, the scientists and the humanitarians and all the people that have been awarded, tell us a little more about it and, and yeah. who we're honoring this year. Yes. Well, uh, as I said, Dr. Norman Borlaug started it. You can go up to visit his farm outside Cresco, Iowa, in Howard County in Northeast Iowa, it's still down a gravel road. And here's this farm and you say to yourself, how could it be that some kid who grew up on this farm had such an incredible impact on the world? But it was his dedication that he learned on the wrestling mat. Never give up, don't let them pin your shoulder. Oh, wow. And he went to Mexico, spent two decades trying to develop miracle wheat, finally does it, high yielding, disease resistant, 
takes it to India and Pakistan, convinces the leaders of those two countries to change the whole approach to agriculture. Huge political And those risk. are two countries that aren't exactly they, they, in very good They were relations. shooting at each other, except yeah. when Borlaug flew back and forth. <laughs> he, he, did, he was doing his shuttle diplomacy, like Henry Kissinger, <laughs> except it was, about, it was about seeds. But, but if they have this incredible breakthrough, and they go from hundreds of millions who might starve to death to subsistence, to exporting in three or four years. They're announcing the Nobel Prize winners today who will receive the Nobel Prize in December. Uh, Kissin uh, the uh, Borlaug uh, was uh, honored with the Nobel Peace Prize five years later. So Borlaug has the Nobel Peace Prize, the Congressional Gold Medal, America's highest civilian honor, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. There's only three Americans ever have those three awards. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Elie Wiesel, the Holocaust survivor, and the farm boy from, from the Howard County. The farm boy from so Iowa. The, and in this magnificent building, there's replicas of them all the, Exactly, the yes. Home. So uh, Borlaug started the food prize in uh, New York with a sponsor there. Uh, it was going okay for three years. There was corporate restructuring, about Project to disappear. Cuts. Borlaug, 77 years old. He comes to Iowa. He meets John Ruan Sr who's also 77. They were born one month apart in small towns in Iowa. And uh, they uh, each have a dream. Borlaug's dream is Nobel Prize for Food and Agriculture. John Ruan's dream is, I want Des Moines and Iowa to be the food and agricultural capital of America. They meet, they see some common ground. Uh, the uh, state legislature, controlled by Democrats, and Governor Branstad, Republican governor, agree that they're going to create a unique partnership, and uh, they do. So the state provides some money, John Ruan puts in some money, Iowa State helps out, and the prize is relocated to Iowa in 1990, and it's doing uh, okay. I showed up in 1999 when I retired from the State Department, so I've been here 18 years, and um, Doing that. When I arrived, I had one employee. The World Food Prize was a one-day event, and maybe 50 people came from outside Iowa for it. Now it's a week-long set of events, plus we have programs all year. Uh, we'll have a thousand people or so who will show up, plus another four, 450 high school students and teachers. Uh, will be here. We have a, the Hunger Summit, which is free. We'll have six, seven, eight hundred people come from all over the state for that. Five secretaries of agriculture are, are coming. That's a record this year. I yes, think. absolutely. Uh, and then the governor will come at the hunger luncheon and you can sign up for free to come to that. Then we, there's a lecture up at Iowa State that night. There's lectures on other college campuses. Then we have the Borlaug Dialogue Symposium. So I have speakers come from all around the world. You have to register and pay to go to that. Uh, and then on Thursday night, we go up to the Capitol. We have an incredible privilege, cr incredible tribute to Dr. Borlaug that the state has made the building uh, available for our ceremony. So it looks like the Nobel Prize. It's, it is fantastic. It actually, it actually looks better than, I've been to the Nobel Prize. Our, it's better our, our here building, Our building is better. <laughs> you know, no, 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 Iowans no, are not supposed either. to be boasting <laughs> like that, but uh, I can't, you know, my mom told me, don't tell a lie. And, and so our building, our building is, is better, and the ceremony is just as good. And, um, but it's an incredible. And our winner this year is named uh, Akinwumi Adashina. He's the president of the African Development Bank. He's from Nigeria, grew up in poverty. Education was the way he advanced himself. Uh, got to go to Purdue University and uh, was uh, has a PhD and has been uh, leading efforts in Africa and has this incredible vision. When I came uh, to take over the World Food Prize, and I don't choose, the, I don't have any vote in who the winner is, I uh, just solicit nominations and announce the name, but uh, there were no women laureates and no African laureates in uh, 1999 when I showed up. Now we have six women, six African laureates, it's not enough, but one of the great moments was in 2012. Our laureate was an Israeli 
uh, irrigation pioneer named Daniel Hillel. Oh, I remember. Remember? Yeah. Yes, wonderful man, wonderful yes. man, out in the de make the desert bloom. He was nominated by three Arab Muslim scientists for our prize. The Secretary General of the United Nations came to help present the prize. And in the audience, side by side, are an Israeli diplomat, an Arab sheikh, and a Muslim princess, uh, plus people of all backgrounds from around the world. So it's possible in Iowa to have a moment among between Israelis, Arabs, and Muslims, you can find common ground yes. in confronting hunger. Confronting hunger can bring people together across the broadest ethnic, religious, racial, political, and diplomatic differences. And you see it time and time again, whether it's Khrushchev coming to the Garst farm, whether it's uh, Xi Jinping, and, and his father coming mm -hmm. to, uh, to Iowa at the very beginning of America's relationship uh, with, with China, whether it's uh, Henry Wallace going to uh, uh, the Soviet Union uh, or, or China or Mexico, whether it was George Washington Carver uh, providing advice on nutrition to Mahatma Gandhi. Mm -hmm. So Gandhi, the father of Indian democracy independence. and independence, who leads the effort to throw off British colonial rule. 1929, when he makes the decision to start that, he's worried as a vegetarian, I won't be strong enough, my diet won't be uh, sufficient. And he hears that there's a scientist in America who could help him. And he reaches out and gets connected to George Washington Carver, who was at Tuskegee Institute, but who was only a scientist because after being turned away at several different schools because of the color of his skin in other states, was admitted to Iowa State in 1889, first ever black student, student of color, gets his bachelor's, master's degree, and uh, there. so here's this scientist, and he and Gandhi write letters to each other. So in May of this year, I was in Ahmedabad, which is where the Gandhi's home, his little sort of little dwelling, not much of a, of a building is where he started in 1929. And I'm standing there and thinking about, wow, how did somebody who started here transform a billion people and make them independent? So I commissioned a painting that's here in this uh, ga Iowa gallery. And I told people the story in Ahmedabad. No one there, no Indians there know the story. I told them the story about the father of their independence, of their freedom, of their democracy, and how a scientist who was a scientist only because of Iowa helped play a small, but, but maybe not insignificant role in a billion people being free and living in democracy. Wow. What great stories. We oh, could yes. just talk all day long yeah. about this. And yeah. but we, we we need to be respectful of your time and how much time footage we have available on this camera. <laughs> <laughs> so much. Yeah, it was Thank fun. you so much yeah. for being our guest today yeah. and no, sharing thanks, these thanks for having stories. me. This is fun. Uh, well, and yeah, and for for being willing to talk to us in October, we know yeah. what your calendar yes. looks like this month. So yeah. thank you for and, being here. And you know, uh, Taro played uh, such a great role with one of our former high school interns, yes. named Anne Langu. Mm -hmm. when she was a candidate to be Miss America. Yes. So she's, a, you know, a, trained as an uh, ophthalmological surgeon. And uh, when she was uh, 16 years old, sent her to China uh, to work in the biotechnology labs at Peking University. And that, uh, but uh, and she was Taro, Taro put, well, we, we prepped her for <laughs> the, yeah. the platform at the yeah. Miss America pageant. You, you, did, you, did, you did a great job. Uh, she was back last year. Yeah, played, she played, played her violin when the other performer, performer didn't the show up. Didn't come in yes, they're on live TV. I'm there. <laughs> what am I going to do? My performer didn't show up to entertain everyone. And there's Anne. And there's Anne. I said, Anne, can you come up and play? 
Actually, I talked to her. Everybody thought I was so terrible putting her on the spot, but I had really talked to her before. Yeah, she, she was willing to she do it. That. But it was great TV. <laughs> yeah, it was great TV. <laughs> yes, but well, she was thank you yes. so much. Okay, yeah, thank great you. being with you. Great yeah, to be with you. and give us your feedback on how you feel about these outtakes or this overtime kind of a program. First time we tried it, so thanks yeah. for joining us.